You are watching Montgomery County Republican Club's Direct Line Show. Our special guest this evening, we've got the Chesapeake First Ladies. We have First Lady of the Great State of Maryland, Kendall Ehrlich, from 2003 to 2006. And we've got the Great First Lady, Susan Allen, from... Ah, uh, hold on. Uh, Kendall, uh, <laughs> Susan Allen... From the great state of Virginia, 1990, she was first lady from 1994 to uh, 1996. 98. Welcome. 98. 98. 98. All right. I'm going to take over from there. Thank you, Toy. And thank you, ladies, for joining me. It's one of our super fun female takeovers. Mm -hmm. uh, I give it a much more, a much cooler, different name back behind the scenes to Nicole. I'll tell you guys about later. Can't say it on screen, but it's awesome. And of course, thank you to Nicole Bennett, first vice chair of the MDGOP for co-hosting with me tonight. We gave Mark the night off and super excited to have all you ladies on. We have so much to talk about, so much going on in the news. Um, mm -hmm. How is everyone doing? Great. Great, thanks. It's awesome. been an awesome evening. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to go back and touch on Virginia first. Obviously, we're a couple weeks out from that now, but everyone is still riding that high. Um, Susan, obviously, you, you were on ground zero there. You got to be in the middle of all the action. So what did it feel like to really see that resurgence of voters coming out for Glenn Youngkin? You know, it was so exciting and it really reminded George and me of 1993 when mm -hmm. nobody gave us a chance. And yet we were able to have such a huge ground game and pull in, you know, a big uh, sweep of 17 percent uh, voting margin when we won. But the interesting thing in this race is that um, Glenn Youngkin and Winsome Sears and Jason Miares ran as a ticket, generally speaking. In Virginia, we don't. Each each race is separate. And normally all candidates rate, run separately for atten attorney general, lieutenant governor and governor. But uh, they really worked as a team this year. And furthermore, Glenn really uh, made sure that he was with every House of Delegates candidate. Mm -hmm. A hundred uh, seats were up and we had co um, contestants in every one of them. So Glenn really benefited from having, you know, the grassroots from these other campaigns. Uh, he didn't have to raise quite as much money as some candidates might because he was a self-funder. Um, but that certainly helped him get his message out and helped him help these other candidates as well. It, um, it, it certainly seemed like the race turned when in the second debate, Governor McAuliffe made a mistake by saying that parents should not be involved in education. And that truly is when the campaigns pivoted and all of a sudden people uh, just couldn't believe their ears. And the soccer moms and security moms be became school moms. Mm -hmm. And there was no going past them anymore. They were going to come out in full force. And that really is what unified our entire ticket and led to a, a big sweep. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to go a lot more into schools and what's going on in schools a little bit later in the show. But definitely... Parents were the deciding vote year, and I think that that's something we're going to see continue on throughout going into the midterms next year. Um, but that is an interesting fact about not running as a slate and how running as a slate. And, and I will say if there's one thing that Republicans definitely beat the left at every single time, it's our grassroots game. So that's Absolutely. You know, any candidates listening, slate up with your friends, save yourself some money and get out there and knock doors. So, Kendall, does that kind of give you a lot of hope going into our races next year for governor and holding on to those seats? Oh, thank you, Virginia. It was such <laughs> a great night for everybody in the country. Yeah. Just, just like, oh. Thank you. Common sense. People got out. Right. Yes. Uh, people are tired of this. And uh, Susan, I, I take issue with one thing you said, and that is that Terry McAuliffe made a mistake. And mm -hmm. I beg to differ. <laughs> I think that that's exactly what they think. They they You're think right. that they know better than you and mm -hmm. your family. That that, that is I, true. I, I see a lot of people. Um, uh, on social media that just say, no, you know, teachers know best about teaching your children. And I think finally that hit so close to home with people like, whoa, wait a minute. And, you know, COVID had been the perfect storm for them yes. in the presidential mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. Well, COVID helped here because COVID is why people started paying attention because they were listening in their homes to what was being taught to their children. Yes, And exactly. I think they said, whoa, wait a minute. And, you know, people showing up at uh, school board meetings mm -hmm. and uh, now the, the school board elections are 
everybody's paying attention to them or before it was, you know, people went in and just went down the ticket, had no idea what people thought. And th again, thank you Loudoun County for being sort of ground zero for all of us in the country. Uh, if you were following some of the news outlets that, that really covered that outrageous behavior. Um, and uh, again, at toward the end of, you know, at the end, near the end of the election cycle or what, right before the election actually occurred, you know, what went on in Loudoun County with the school board and uh, the young woman that had gone into the bathroom and had been raped and her father came to the school board meeting and was arrested. I mean, when we all saw that, I think that all was like, I can't believe what's happening to America. And I think it really right. helped. Uh, people go to the polls and say enough is enough. We, we need to take a stand here. Well, and it's also get, you're really renewing that faith in elections. I think you saw a lot of people on the right really dejected after 2020. And mm -hmm. I think this really restored a lot of faith in saying, no, you know what? Staying home isn't going to get you the result you want. If you show up and you vote, you, you know, we can still win races. You know, we've seen this pattern before. You go out and you vote and you win. Um, but definitely, you know, Nicole, as a parent, I definitely want to bring you in this conversation as well. Everything that's been going on. And then we have this leaked email that came out now with that. They actually were, in fact, despite lying about it, tagging parents as terrorist threats mm -hmm. for caring about their students, caring about their kids. I mean, Nicole, what, what is your take following all this going on? Listen, none of this is new. None of this is new. This has been going on for a while. When we talk about um, progressivism and that slippery slope. We're just now down at the bottom of the slope. Um, so this is what happens. Your kid comes home with homework. You look at it and you're like, mm, you know, it's kind of sketch, but I'm just going to let it go. It's not that big of a deal. I think what really turned the tide, and I agree with Kendall, is when the kids were at home. Mm -hmm. And you may not have really been paying attention. I mean, it's kind of background noise, but you hear things. You know, the class is called equality. I mean, can't go wrong with that, right? That's a great <laughs> name for a class. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing to, to pay close attention. But when you start hearing things like America is an inherently racist country, that the Constitution was developed and devised to make sure that African-American people can never get ahead. Those are the kind of things that make you put your coffee cup down and go say, what now? Um, what class is this? When is it going to get equal? What are we talking about? There are stories from across the country of parents who had that revelation. The question was, now what do we do about it? So yeah. you go to a school board meeting and you get shouted down by the very same people that you blindly elected last year. Quite frankly, you elected them because you had to pick five, so you picked the top five. You know, there have been stories of people right. changing their last name so that they'll appear at the top of the ballot just to get in. America learned a valuable lesson. We have yeah. got to be much more attentive to the people that we trust our children to. My daughter um, went to private school. And the reason why she went to a private Christian school is because she's an only child. She's the only granddaughter. She's quite literally the holy grail, right? So she was not <laughs> properly socialized. I will say this, she's not properly socialized at all. So I had to pay a little bit of extra money so that she can get an education where, where the classes were smaller and she could get in far less trouble um, you know, just generally speaking in schools, but there were always times where I was in the classroom listening to what the teacher said, listening to make sure that it was appropriate, listening to make sure that my daughter was not getting revisionist history. And it sometimes it's, you know, intentional and sometimes it may be unintentional, but as a parent, it's 100% my responsibility to make sure that my daughter grows into a productive citizen. That's what parents are doing. Teachers don't have that responsibility. They're reading, writing, and arithmetic. Parents are responsible for how their children turn out. That's something that the right has for a long time been kind of chipping away at. But now those mama bears and papa bears, let me tell you, 2022 looks really good from where we're sitting. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, before the show started, I was throwing a couple of headlines at you guys. I wanted to go into more detail because, I mean, we've, we've been beating CRT like a dead horse at this point. I mean, it goes without saying, no one's saying don't teach history. In fact, we want you to teach history. We have negative parts for past. Don't teach kids that they're either oppressors or oppressed because that doesn't get anybody anywhere. But some of these other headlines, I mean, we'll go through the list. But the first one that I've been reading about is that teachers are walking around wearing mask and tape like a bracelet. And if your mask falls down under your nose, that they're taping them to your face. I mean, first of all, I mean, I am not a parent. I'm a dog mom. 
But if someone laid a hand on my little dog, you know, to take a mask to my dog's face, I would come out screaming, right? Don't touch my kid. I know Delilah. Delilah would not sit still for that. Just so you know, Delilah <laughs> is quite the prima donna. She's not having any of that. Um, but I will say that there are lots of horror stories. That there's a young girl, I think I saw it on Facebook, it may have been Insta yesterday, who's been suspended from school 36 times. She made a difference, though. For not wearing her mask. Now, you know, as an eight to 10 year old, I can see there's, you know, some positivity in that. If, if you don't really want to be in that environment, pull the mask down and let them send you home. It kind of works out. But at some point, we have to kind of look at the simplicity of her protest. I don't want to do this. There's really no reason for me to do this. And oh, by the way, the punishment is you're going to send me to the place where I want to be anyway. Yeah. Here, lady, here's your mask back. Send me on home. But I don't want our children to live in a world where they don't feel like the adults that are supposed to care and take care of them are not listening. And that's what we are finding with this. The next thing is with these COVID vaccines for five to 11 year olds. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm a healthcare executive. I love that we have something to help fight. For small children, not so much. But I think the next series of stories we're gonna hear about are school nurses who accidentally vaccinated your child. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, those kind of things are gonna happen um, because there are some people who are really dogged. We really have got to keep our eyes on the prize here with our children. And can I ask you why you are hesitant about the vaccine for the younger ages, since um, you, you have more knowledge than maybe the rest of us? It's not necessary. So uh, small children get vaccinated all the time. And the reason why their immune systems are ratcheted up so high is because every single time it seems like they come in for an appointment, they're due for something. Um, so their bodies fight things off. And, and Jackie knows how I feel about toddlers. They're just little germ incubators, right? They're super cute. (laughs) And I always say this, if God made them cute for a reason, because if they were butt ugly, we'd ship them off to an island until they grew up long enough not to kill a frog. (laughs) Their immune systems are so strong. Like they can fight off things that would quite literally take us out. Things like flu A and flu B. Mm -hmm. As an adult, when we get the flu, I mean, that's hospital worthy. As a child, they they sniffle a little bit. They don't feel well for a day. And before you know it, they're out with their friends, ripping and running and having a good time. We have to be very cognizant as a society. What's good for adults does not necessarily work for children. Um, And I think our kids have had enough. These last two years have been real stinkers for this. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to give them a break. We're putting them back into a classroom after a year, year and a half at home doing kind of really what they wanted to do. That transition has been very difficult. My sister is uh, the chief of staff at a public charter boarding school in Washington, D.C. And she talks to me every day about the kids who are saying, I just don't want to be here. I want to go home. Uh And they're just not in what I like to call work ready shape. They're just not. And to force this vaccine on them, quite literally, I think would be too much for their their souls to bear at bear at this point. We've got to get well, them. Well, and you, you you may have heard that actually they have given the wrong dosage in some yep. cases, mm-hmm. and uh, I think in general regarding vaccines, re- regarding masks, regarding education as a whole, the point is as parents we need to be and want to be engaged. Yes. And I think that has been the, the bottom line. And you said teachers are worried about teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Actually, unfortunately, they're not teaching that anymore mm-hmm. right. because right. they're spending time on other things. In Virginia, they've dumbed down the standards so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were going to get away with, uh, get rid of higher math. Mm-hmm. Uh, they George, when he was governor, put in the standards of learning that were deemed to be some of the best in the country because Mm -hmm. there were ways to measure whether our students Mm -hmm. were actually learning at each stage. And you're right, during COVID, parents saw uh, they were no longer learning economics. They weren't Mm -hmm. learning history. They weren't studying uh, sociology even and, and as much as they try to push all these other agendas. But I think the bottom line is parents have to be involved. They've got to be involved in these school board meetings, whether the school board members like it or not. And here in Virginia Beach, as a matter of fact, they've not only kept parents out, but they've tried to keep some of the school board members out based on how they vote. So they have Mm -hmm. really stirred the pot down here. But I think that just adds fuel to the fire that parents have burning in them saying, wait a second, we want what's best for our kids. We want them to graduate, go on to tech schools or yes. higher ed at some level. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, we want them to be successful. Right now, it seems like there are too many things thwarting that. Mm -hmm. And the year of COVID, the two years of COVID certainly piles into, you know, what has stalled uh, the success of our kids. But that, maybe that's made parents stronger. And frankly, maybe that's what helped switch uh, the political thinking around. And I'm sorry, everybody had to go through COVID, uh, the seasons mm -hmm. of COVID to get to that point. But maybe that was the silver lining. Yeah, I mean, I do think we're we're on the cusp of a revolution in education. We're seeing parents pull their kids out at, at rapid rates mm -hmm. with just the CRT stuff. And now with the, well, if you're going to force my kid to get vaccinated, like, OK, I'll do it to keep my livelihood, to keep food on the table for my kid. But, you know, you know the liberals who, who worship the healthcare system in Europe, in Europe, they're not vaccinating anyone under 30. Mm -hmm. um, right. So but I think that that could be the final strike for a lot of parents. And unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of working class parents who can't homeschool their kids. But I think that we're going to see a continuation of those learning pods. I think we might mm -hmm. actually see innovation in education mm -hmm. as it becomes right. more privatized, as it becomes some of these teachers that are leaving the schools who are fed up with the way that things are being done. Mm -hmm. like start teaching smaller private classes in their homes. I think we could see something like that and people will be competing for educating right. children. And honestly, it I don't is, think that's necessarily a bad thing. No, it is about competition. And frankly, that's why George implemented the standards so that you could look in Patrick County, Virginia and Fairfax County, Virginia and Virginia Beach and see if everybody's standards were the same. Yes. And if not, you were gonna compete for it. Frankly, all three of our kids went through public school the entire way. And Fairfax County was the most difficult to deal with. Mm. And uh, I, I had to put up many a fight uh, just to get my kids in, into advanced classes or whatever, because oh. they would take care of the ESOL kids, but they weren't taking care of the kids who had aspirations to go on to college. Mm -hmm. And uh I have many a tale of, of teachers standing in front of the classroom saying, literally, let's put a sword or a knife through the back of the governor who created the standards of learning in front of my own kids. Um, so, wow. the, you know, the, the, the fact that parents have always needed to be engaged is important. But even now, uh, more than ever, I think people understand that. So I'm going to throw one more headline at you guys. And, and Kendall, we'll start with you on this one. And this one is, again, something that shocked me and I know is a very nuanced and, and difficult issue. Actually, my, my sister-in-law's mom is a teacher and is dealing with this, a, a similar mandate where the schools are saying that you need to, as a teacher, refer to a student as the pronouns and the name that they would prefer. And if it's different than the one that their parents gave you when they signed them up, you are not allowed to tell the parents. Well, I think that's outrageous. And yeah. uh, I think that, uh, again, that is more fuel for the fire as we get into election cycles and we get into what you all just talked about, which is competition in education. I mm -hmm. guarantee you charter schools will succeed in particularly red states mm -hmm. and religious schools will also start popping up more, more so. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the Archdiocese in Maryland, unfortunately, has closed a lot of schools. Yeah. I hope that they're really thinking about reopening them because they were such great options, particularly in, in hard hit areas, underprivileged areas. Uh -huh. And we're often, you know, the next most affordable type of schooling out there. So, you know, we talked a little bit uh, before coming on, you know, this doubling down on this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. You know, to think that the Democrats might be doubling down on this kind of approach, you know, from our perspective is like, OK, bring it on <laughs> Learn from Virginia. Uh -huh. and, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, back in the yeah. day when my husband went in in the majority in Congress, when um, Newt Gingrich took over the House, uh -huh. you know, Bill Clinton was interesting. He saw the writing on the wall and he worked with Newt Gingrich. Yes. Um, you know, he worked for a balanced budget. He worked for a lot of those items on the uh, contract with America. And I do not see this modern day Democratic Party doing this at all whatsoever. So, no. you know, if they're going to do this with education and continue to force this wedge with what with children and their parents, it is not going to end well for them. I, I, I feel very strongly about that. Yeah. I think really, what the, for them, I think what they think is Virginia was a one-off, right? Um, 
So what we're, we're seeing here in Maryland is kind of the rearranging of the chairs on the Titanic. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> you mean redistricting? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right? You, so, that? you know, oh, yeah. um, we are just doomed on that, aren't we? It, it is just, it, it's mind boggling. So before we came on, I was at um, the Green Turtle with uh, Delegate Matt Morgan, who's a delegate in St. Mary's County, and I live in Charles. So Charles County, um, I, because of our population increase, um, it's going to have a small part of it that either um, it's going to go with St. Mary's or a piece to Prince George's County. Maybe both. You know, no one knows with this map. So Matt says, OK, I'll run in Charles if I have to. You know, we it's the southern part of Charles. There are lots of Republicans there. Um, a local Democrat turned well, Republican turned Democrat, stay Democrat, decided that he wanted to challenge Matt Morgan for the seat. He thinks that he can win in St. Mary's County. He has a, a good old Southern Maryland name and that kind of thing. So Matt pulls out the redistricting map um, from the, the LRAC, as we call it, the, the Democrats Legislative Redistricting Commission. And the whole point <laughs> was so the map didn't look like a broken wing pterodactyl. Well, now it looks like a crab that's been smashed with a mallet. <laughs> they've cut Baltimore City into all of these little weird pieces and they've kind of dragged Prince George's in and and I mean when I say rearranging the chairs on the Titanic that is what I mean they mm -hmm. really think um, that people don't value traditional values and if Virginia taught them nothing it should be that that okay fine we agree with you on a couple of very liberal things and because it doesn't really interfere with our day-to-day -day, but when you start talking about education and i have children in school um, right you know when you start talking about black people being oppressed you know here's here's a headline i've been black my whole life right um, so <laughs> when you talk about oppression i'm looking at you going where you know mm -hmm. i had two college educated parents i was blessed enough to, to have a college education myself my daughter is away now at college um, mm -hmm. you know, oppression is one of those words. I don't know anyone, um, and I know quite a few people who feel like they're being oppressed, mm -hmm. but there's this steady drumbeat with our children that you're oppressed, you're oppressed, be angry, you're oppressed. And I'm like, how are you oppressed? You've got $5,000 worth of microcomputer in your pocket called a cell phone. That's not mm -hmm. oppression. That's not what oppression feels like. It's a perversion of our history. And when they do that, they take something that was so horrible and focus on that instead of focusing on right. our brilliant future and how far right. we've come. There's so many better ways to teach that. But I think the Democrats say, oh, well, you know, Virginia was a one off. You know, Maryland will never get itself together. It'll be another uh, whitewash of this. I don't want to call it a smash crab because that's not fair to crabs. But <laughs> this new redistricting map is quite the colorful sort. And you know it's not going to fly. It's not right. going to fly. But they spent the better part of Tuesday evening on their call calling Andy Harris some of the fanciest names I've heard people call a sitting congressman, insurrectionist, uh, a no, that's terrible. And, and I'm waiting for someone in our state legislator to grab their gavel and bring that meeting to order. And they did not. They did well, not. Well, uh, Susan, unlike Virginia, where you uh, got the legislature in this last election as well, I mean, that, that feat is just so difficult Amazing. here. And that, yeah. Therein lies the rub. Um, you know, we can win. We've proven to be able to win the governorship. Mm -hmm. uh, still have to look at that, those Senate seats. That's, that's more difficult. But, you know... The legislature is really where it's at, and it's really tough here. You know, we've attempted several times to become veto-proof with those five Senate seats, mm -hmm. and yeah. we just haven't been able to cross the finish line. And it's really tough, and it's, you know, these uh, buzzwords uh, continue to, it's you know, just right out of the playbook, right out of the media playbook, right out mm -hmm. of the Democratic playbook. And here in Maryland, we hear that over and over and over again. And I feel sorry for Andy Harris. That's ridiculous. He's he should be respected. He's been a great Absolutely. congressman for his yeah. his um, you know uh, the Eastern Shore and then his whole district. Mm -hmm. So it's it's appalling. But like you said, there's no consequences. Yes. And therein, li and therein lies the rub. Well, we've done a little bit of of winning. Um, so we took on a project of um, winning municipal elections. 
you know, to strengthen our Great. Yeah, and you're right. That's the way to do it. And that's the way we've been growing. And just last night in Del Mar, we've got a new mayor and two okay. brand new Republican um, con or, uh, councilmen. Council. Yeah. And they won in a landslide. It wasn't even close. They yeah. weren't even in the same neighborhood. Down in uh, Heather Mazur's um, uh, district um, in Chestertown, she has a new councilman. His name yeah. is Jose. He's a Republican. We yeah. found Jose from a postcard that we mailed out. <laughs> Jackie and I and, and, and um, another friend. That's orange with yeah. orange brushes and stamping postcards. That's exactly yeah. where we were at a, a Lincoln Douglas dinner. And we were like, okay, we'll be over in a few minutes. Let us finish stamping these index cards that quite literally said red alert. We're looking for people to run for office. And lo and behold, you know, Heather Mazur has a new councilman and he's a Republican in a place where they said Republicans can't win. So we're kind of chipping away at it. But these redistricting maps um, that the LRAC has put forth are, are just, it makes it worse. Um, they've taken the worst gerrymandered districts in the entire nation, right. put their heads together and made them worse. I mean, talking about doubling down on dumb, what do they mm -hmm. think is gonna happen when it gets to court? Cause we all know that's where it's gonna end up, right? It is, we but can't. you know, the Supreme Court would not would not uh, determine our lines. They said they're yeah. not going to get into the drawing of it, not in Maryland and not in, in Texas, where, you know, the two the two maybe most gerrymandered states and opposite parties went yes. up yes. and they're staying out of it. So the other thing is you got to look at, you know, I th hopefully uh, we've been able to get in enough judges under mm -hmm. Hogan. We have uh, to prevent that from uh, for at least have being able to be optimistic. But, you know, there was a day in Maryland that it wasn't so optimistic if it went to court. Yes. So I, I just don't know where that's going to be. And we don't know. So it, it'll be interesting. I agree. I think it's an interesting time to be a Republican in Maryland. We are yeah. so also heady from um, the Yunkin campaign. I mean, I know Jackie worked on yeah. the campaign. Um, one of my organizations, um, the Black Republican Council, sent a hundred thousand text messages for Glenn Yunkin, yeah. another hundred thousand for Winston Sears. You know, um, in a three-day period. I mean, we texted our faces off, making sure we knocked doors. You know. That win wasn't just for Virginia. It was for all of us. Right. It was. It was and it's so true. Sense. Yeah. It's so true. And I, I really feel like everybody felt that way. I mean, especially when you start getting that sense, we can actually do this. We're going to win this. We're going to win this. George and I both were with Suzanne and Glenn a lot, um, trying to help their campaign in different ways, either emceeing things. I was doing stuff for her. Mm -hmm. uh, he was flying around with Glenn. He did an RV tour with Jason Miares, who was running for attorney general. Jason's a Cuban American. His mom came here with nothing. Um, has a really interesting story. Jason worked on our 2000 campaign for Senate. So he's like a, almost like a child. Kendall, you know that they, your right. staff becomes your, your flock of children. <laughs> uh, Jason, Jason met his wife on our campaign actually. Um, oh, wow. so there he's going to be great. He's going to be good, a good law and order attorney general. He, uh, uses George's phrases and words and that's okay. We need it all again, as we did in 93. And then Winsome Sears, too. I mean, she brought a whole different element to things. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. her background is Jamaican. She's mm -hmm. a business person. She served in the Marine Corps. Um, and Winsome, it, it, she will speak her mind. And so while the lieutenant governor doesn't uh, have very much authority in Virginia, they do break tie votes in the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that she'll be a powerful voice for Republicans. And mm -hmm. it's going to be nice to have uh, you know, the variety that we have, they're all super talented. It's not that they were chosen because of their ethnic background. It's because yes. they had they had the right issues and the right voices for what Virginia needed. You were talking a little bit about the legislature and, and how difficult that can be. I mean, we ha still have two contested races, and I don't think that they'll switch back to the Democrats, but they could. And if that's the case, we'll be sharing power in the House. But um, when George was governor, we had a Democrat House and a Democrat senator, Senate. And the way you worked things was you found common interests on mm -hmm. issues. And I think that's how you're winning local races, too. As long as mm -hmm. you're convincing right. people that you can belong together and work in a unified way on issues that matter to the constituents, then everybody wins. And um, 
I think little by little, your legislature may change, but even if it doesn't, as long as you're winning on issues, um, that's the key. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I've been like, that's kind of the thing I preach living in Montgomery County is although hopefully if the maps go our way, we might have a little bit of opportunity here. For sure. Um, yeah. But I, I've been saying, you know, we have incredible Republicans running across the state. And even if I can't vote for them or people in Montgomery County can't vote for them, we sure as hell can can grassroots the crap out of their campaigns for them because even though we don't live in their districts they are still representing every republican in the state of maryland and, we right. and kudos to you guys for doing that because it really does take that even in the age of social media now mm -hmm. and utilizing social media of course but you know the grassroots is really where it's at for for everybody and it's you know it always comes down to turnout yes absolutely yep. Well, that's the thing is getting that message out there is like, hey, see what happened in Virginia? They had the biggest turnout, again, that they've had in a long, long time for an election. So, and we still pulled it out. So it's not rigged. You just need to go out and vote. It's all about turnout. And you know what's interesting in Virginia this year, we had 45 days of voting. And that wow. was really hard for Republicans because norm normally our patriotic Republicans like to vote on election oh, really? day. They like going into the voting booth and pulling the lever or writing it in or whatever they do. But to try to convince them to vote early so that our candidates could see uh, how our numbers were coming in was crucial this year. And it really took a lot of persuasion. Everybody had to be on the same sheet saying, please uh -huh. go vote. It, it, the elections will be fine just go vote early. So we're we're trying to beat the Democrats at their game. They were the ones who usually voted early, had all the absentee ballots. They did unfortunately win in the absentee ballots. And we're not we're not quite sure how um, how we overcome that. I think if we can get more parents to ask their college students to vote absentee and our military to vote absentee, that probably can help our numbers. But we were uh, like 65, 35 on uh, absentee ballots, sadly. Yeah. It's an interesting call about early voting because my husband always argues for the independent voter or the, the center, right center, left center, mm -hmm. you know, what if those issues come up at the end, like they did in, in the Virginia race, mm -hmm. right? Where, that might really change your thought pattern uh, and right. you've already voted. So it's it's kind of an interesting give and take. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that if you're strong, you know, one way with your party, then voting that way is probably good to get it, you know, early so that people know the trends and see what's happening. Right. But there is sort of that middle that you don't want to vote too soon because of all the things that happen within 45 days. Yeah, I mean, really, you remember, you know politics. the campaign. You, you know, Correct. Susan. The, you know, the last two weeks are critical, mm -hmm. and 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 the feeling up or down in the last two weeks, and it boils down to that last two weeks, which right. is really insane. But so, these like, these these were the guidelines that the Democrat legislature set up that we were going to have early voting, no voter uh, photo ID, which I hope will change uh, right yeah, away terrible. in the session this year. Because I think that's terrible mm -hmm. if that you don't have to prove who you are with a photo ID. I mean, oh, we don't have to still... here in Maryland. We don't have that. Think... And we'll never be able to. Oh, if you try to give your ID, they, they go ballistic. Mm -hmm. Ugh. It's terrible. You have to give it for everything else. I know. The, the doctor's office, getting on an airplane, anything else you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no excuse for it. But anyway, the Democrats are the ones who, you know, kind of changed the rules on the playing field this year. But I, I'm very proud of our side convincing voters, especially on the heels of the Trump election, where voters mm -hmm. were so skeptical mm -hmm. of, you know, the validity of, you know, casting their vote and counting their vote and all of that. Uh, I, I feel like somehow that message got through and we had enough people voting early that really helped us concentrate on those who had not voted yet, get the mailings to them, the phone calls, the robocalls to them, and uh, save some expense for some of the candidates in the end too. I think yeah. it was great when um, the platform that we used for texting um, the weekend of uh, Halloween, people actually respond to you when you text them, kind of just like any other text message. A lot of the text messages said, hey, I already voted, let's go Brandon. 
you know, hey, I already voted, you know, yunkin for, for governor, or I voted for Winsome, I wish I could have voted uh -huh. twice, you know, those kind of things. And I thought to myself, man, a great many of these people have already voted, have already made their decision um, from a campaign standpoint. I would have liked to know that before I spent that five cents to send that text message to this person who's already cast it there. I mean, it seems like when that that window to vote is so wide, um, yeah. it makes it more difficult, not just to for the voters, because too much time to vote. I may say, Correct. well, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow never comes. There's that. Well, um, it, but it, I think. It, I'm sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. Finish up. I want to sign in on that. I think. From a campaign standpoint, why spend, you know, that six thousand dollars texting people who've already voted for you when you can re use that resource for robocalls, for door knocking on people who yeah. haven't yet cast their ballot? Well, this is how crazy it is. At, at the end, I'm, I'm a political consultant uh, when I choose to be and was working on a House of Delegates ca uh, campaign this year for a woman running down here for the first time. And she uh, did not debate her opponent, and I actually stood in for her in the final debate at a Westminster Canterbury, and it was about two weeks before the election, and my first question to the audience was, how many of you have already voted? And thankfully, every hand in the audience went up, which means it would have been a waste of her time to go. It mm -hmm. was a waste of the Democrats' time to be there, but I didn't care. I kept him busy, so he couldn't mm -hmm. be out knocking on doors or doing other things. And, you know, I just told the audience, well, we're going to have a nice discussion today on issues and uh, went through all of them. But but that that's the kind of thing you can actually gauge, you know, who what precincts have already had a, a heavy turnout. And Glenn mm -hmm. Youngkin was very good using technology and analytics every single day. Mm -hmm. They were getting information and analyzing where they needed to target the, uh, the turnout next. So uh, we, we're finally catching up to what the Democrats, I think, have been doing well from the past many years. Well, what I'm hearing is we're going to go into business finding some kind of technology that will figure out when someone's already voted and remove them from your paid, you know, this is who we're paying to reach out to. <laughs> that's <laughs> what going that's that's to be done. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so there's one other, obviously, the biggest news story going on right now that I wanted to touch on before we close out. And that's what's going on in Kenosha right now. Mm -hmm. um, we're on day two of jury deliberations. They've been sent home. They still haven't come to decision. A lot of what I've read online, I don't really watch CSI or any of the, the crime shows or anything, but they've talked about how normally a slower decision is good for the defendant. Uh, I mean, and I think honestly, the biggest part of what I want to talk about is just so concerning of this whole idea of mob rule, right? Is mm -hmm. are the reason they're taking so long is because I've read that they can hear the death threats coming through the walls of mm -hmm. the courthouse of the people standing by and the National Guard standing by because they think that there's going to be even more rioting should the jury make the wrong decision. Of course, now they're filing for a mistrial because of the drone footage and that's a whole other topic. But what's your take on that? And is our legal system in jeopardy because we're not really sequestering juries anymore in these high profile cases and, and they can't tune out what's happening in the media and what's happening in the streets. I'll take this as a former prosecutor. Uh, first of all, the prosecution was appalling. Yes. Um, and, it, you know, it started from the very beginning. No one indicts a case in three days. It's exactly. just outrageous that there had been no proper uh, investigation, uh, all of that going into it. That being said, um, and, and then seeing his behavior on uh, right there on the screen for all of us to see, it, it was really kind of embarrassing. And I almost mm -hmm. thought that he, it, it, I just thought it was so obviously politically motivated, mm -hmm. not legally motivated, uh, not done well at all. And um, I think having uh, been in the criminal justice system for a very long time, I still believe in the system. I think it's a fabulous system. It's the best in the world. Mm -hmm. I believe in juries. I believe in what they come back with for the most part. Um, and I, I really do. I just think it's really a fabulous, amazing system. We have lots of issues right now because of uh, where we are. Uh, we have these um, uber liberal progressive mm -hmm. uh, prosecutors that are taking it upon themselves not to follow the law, 
They should really be impeached. They're not following the oath that they took. Mm -hmm. They uh, are determining what they'll enforce and what they won't enforce. That's the job of the legislature, not their job. Uh, they are to enforce everything that is on the books. So that's sort of, a, you know, an, an appalling thing. I do think that these high profile cases, juries should be sequestered. Um, I Obviously, they can still get some things coming in because of social media now. It's, it's really hard to control. But, you know, them seeing the National Guard every day, mm -hmm. them coming into the courthouse with the National Guard, all of the intimidation that's happening in this particular case is really outrageous. I think it would have been much better for them to have been sequestered. Um, you know, they've probably seen at night all the things that wasn't mm -hmm. even in their purview because of all the clips. Um, yeah. I think that the influence on that and, and the outside influence is bad. And I'm actually concerned now that we're into, you know, the second day, third day, it seems like, you know, either somebody's holding out or they're trying to figure out for their town not to burn again. Right. And, and right. that's not the objective. The objective is guilt or innocence, mm -hmm. period. That's their job. So I do think that there's a lot of outside influence. It could be interesting because the judge has various options depending on what comes back. The judge could say that there's not a sufficient evidence and go against what the jury's done. He could declare a mistrial just based on the fact that the National Guard's standing outside. For sure. So it's, it's a really crazy trial. Um, and, and again, we can't allow our justice system to be determined by social discourse and what's happening on the street and protesting. Right. It's outrageous. We can't do it. We have to be firm and strong. But it's scary, right? When you're one of these jurors and you're like, you know, I was... I. I got the, the short straw, right? And I got jury duty that day and I got selected for this. And now there are protesters sitting outside taking my picture and finding out where I live. And, you know, it has to be unanimous choice. They'll know exactly the way that I voted. And it, am I going to be in physical danger, depending on how this goes? It's scary. And then you're seeing, you know, what's obscene is the number of people coming out and, you know, who are saying, you know, the media totally mis misled me on this case. They... Mm -hmm. Till this trial started, genuinely thought that Kyle Rittenhouse went to Kenosha and shot three black people. Right. I think really, Jackie, one of the things that, that we should definitely look at um, is the celebrity part of being on such a high profile trial. You know, while I want to have uh, absolute faith in Americans taking a look at really good information or in this case, really bad information and coming to a rational conclusion, I think seeing this prosecutor basically audition for his show on, you know, ID or on MSNBC because yeah, he's auditioning really to take Alec Baldwin's spot in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it it quite literally was so distasteful. Um, I think there's a reason why courtrooms should still look like church. You know, you need to bring a sense of reverence when you're right. there. You know, I think that's one of the things that the prosecution was missing. I mean the absolute audition of that. And if I'm a juror on this and, you know, Jackie, you know, I'm not a social media type person. I only do it because I have to, and I usually pay my daughter to do it. Um, <laughs> but there are people who are going to take this opportunity and not be fearful. They're probably already typing their outlines for the book that they're going to write, you know, coming out of this. So celebrity or infamy does play a part in this whole thing. And I think had we had a better prosecutor, someone who kind of looked and acted in, and participated in this process as a prosecutor should have, it probably wouldn't have turned into the absolute farce that it is now. When you walk past the National Guard, you know we had Mike Pompeo for our red, white, and blue. When I had to walk past his security, you know, I was thinking to myself, man, Bennett, don't make any jokes. You know, <laughs> don't say, you know, it is intimidating. And I'm a strong person, but I'm standing next to this guy whose neck is the size of a thigh and he's looking me up and down. And I'm thinking, Dude, I'm just here to say a prayer and I'm out of here. Can you imagine having that around you and, and that decision that you're going to make kind of hangs in the balance on what people are going to do. They're going to know, like you said, who they are. There are some people who are going to say, hey, this is my Kim Kardashian moment. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be famous. And there are other people who are like me and you, Jackie, who are like, oh, my God, I'm changing my name. I'm moving out of state, you know, and hoping for the best. But this is not the way 
our legal system is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be. This no, way. but you'd say, you know that the police is there to protect you, except probably in Kenosha because of yes. their philosophy about the police. Yeah. Whatever right. police you know, are left, they've this all This is a gone. very upside down <laughs> time, but normally I think most people in juries, the ones that certainly I was before, they took it seriously. I mean, yes. they really took it seriously. I had many of them talk to me after jury, uh, what their decisions, and, and they were thoughtful and really thought long and hard, and they were very responsible. Now, I get it. Um, I, I, I get this particular jury probably has a little bit of everything you've, you've mentioned, but by the same token, they have to be firm, be strong, follow the law, follow the instructions. This is an 18 year old life on the line here. Yeah, basically. exactly. And uh, there, there are going to be ramifications no matter what they do. Exactly. So yes. I hope there's a leader in that room that is expressing that and trying to say, you know, keep your eye on the ball. Don't stay away from all the chatter. Mm -hmm. and keep going. So I pray that that's the case. I'm, I'm getting more nervous with every day as we should. Yeah. yeah. And Susan, I'll give you a chance to weigh in real quick and then we'll go to our closing. You well, know. I don't know. I mean, Kendall, I think is the expert on, on talking sure. about it, but Kendall is, is it possible that just removing the TVs from the courthouse and limiting the amount of information coming out, out with that at all tamper down some of the hype that goes around these cases. Yeah, I don't know, Susan. I, you know, I kind of practiced in a different era uh, <laughs> that I think that, that it, it's hard to contain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I do think that at least sequestering them at night would right. help. At least kept yes. a lot of the chatter down mm -hmm. for them. Um, so I, I still think sequestering works. Uh, to that degree so mm -hmm. I was thinking for the jury's sake it's like got to be like the mass singer they have them like right black hoodies gloves on mask over the face no one knows who they are walking them out to a car <laughs> I don't know about that but that, that's a lot Jackie we're, we're, that would make it interesting to watch because then you're kind of <laughs> judging you know did that pink cat just lean to the left when right. you see the shirt <laughs> don't talk to me on it <laughs> Um, yeah, but we'll, we'll go through. I know it's the holiday season. Everyone's got something to plug, something coming up. So Kendall, we'll start with you because I know you have props. Oh, yes, we have Original, Unconventional, and Inconvenient by Bob Ehrlich. Ooh, yeah. All analysis of the Trump era. He's brilliant, as you know. Fabulous writer, father, husband. So uh, <laughs> go on Amazon and get this for We're all sorry. of your holiday gifts. Yes, and you can see on the screen there, uh, Governor great. Bob will be doing a book signing on December 2nd in Montgomery County. You can buy tickets at the link below. I'm sure it will sell out, so definitely go out and get that book, and you can come and get it signed. I know I have my picture with Governor Bob hanging up in my room with my other pictures when I was just completely underdressed for Corinne's fundraiser in my purple t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but I later got lasagna on. <laughs> like, yes, go out and get that book. It's a great stocking stuffer. Thank you. All right, Susan, what about you? You guys have something fun planned? Hey, you know, life is great when you live at the beach, regardless. I, I know I tell you that, I think, each time I talk. But I'm so happy and proud of Virginia. The whole state is shining. Like, the sun is just beaming from, from Virginia. And uh, stay tuned for the big inauguration in January. I know that people will be coming from all over. But, um, and keep keep the Yunkins in your prayers, because I think uh, it's wonderful that they have had no background in politics. On the other hand, it's scary that they've had no background in politics. Mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. big change to their life. Yeah, absolutely. And we're all going to be keeping our eyes on Virginia and seeing what positive influence all your new leaders have coming in. Nicole, okay. I'm sure you have about 8,000 things to plug. <laughs> well, you guys don't know this, but I'm a joiner, right? I, I join a lot of organizations. And um, although I am no longer young Republican age, I will be attending the Montgomery <laughs> County Young Republicans holiday party hosted by Jackie, right? Yay! Yay! Those MoCo Young Republicans. I think it's going to be a great time. Um, also, we're going to have um, the Montgomery County Club's um, Toys for Tots party. And, and a lot of um, MVGOP auxiliaries are helping to co-host that 
So we definitely want to make sure that people donate as much as they can Toys for Tots. And I understand that Jackie Saxton is going to have great snacks at her party. So if you don't have a ticket. I get that one from my mom. I'm a party planner at heart. But yes, I follow in Nicole's footsteps in being a joiner. So yes, Mocha Wire's holiday party that's December 16th. It's a Thursday night at 7 o'clock in Bethesda. All that information's on Mocha Wire. Hey, Jackie, can anyone sponsor your party? You can. If you want to sponsor and you're either a small business or a candidate or just like to give us money because we're going to be putting all that money right back into campaigning for our candidates in 22 on the ticket page or something that says make a holiday contribution to the MoCo IRs. Anything above $200 is a sponsorship. You'll get a shout out on our, on our social media. You could talk for five minutes if you're a candidate. Otherwise we'll work something out. If you're a business, we'll post <laughs> something at your business. Um, that's going to be a great time. We have some really great mugs. I don't have mine in reaching distance that we're giving out, but they're really cool. Um, so definitely come on out to that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, MoCo Club, uh, that holiday party, that Toys for Tots is on December 5th. Uh, bring an unwrapped gift for Toys for Tots. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's a gift. Wrap it. Do not wrap it. Um, I got Play-Doh last year and brought that because who doesn't like Play-Doh? Might have kept one for myself. Uh, so come out to that. That's a great event. I think like pretty much every single auxiliary in the state of Maryland is co-sponsoring that. Um my last one, let's say I got to figure out which hat I'm on here. Yes, this one's my yarmulke, right? Maryland Republican Jewish Council will be doing a Montgomery County meetup. We just moved that to December 12th. So you have a little bit more time to get prepared for that. And that's going to be at uh, Sienna's Kosher Pizza. Um, but there's also Jim Shalik is having a meet and greet in Montgomery County this Sunday. So a lot, a lot of stuff going on in the state of Maryland. I'm sure there's equally as much going on in the state of Virginia, um we will be back with one more show right before thanksgiving but for those of you who aren't tuning in on that one happy thanksgiving everybody welcome to the holiday season hopefully you saved up your money because turkey is going to be seriously expensive this year whatever's left over is going to black friday so eat more chicken <laughs> yes eat more, chicken. <laughs> eat more chicken <laughs> thanksgiving when i was studying abroad in london they don't really sell turkey there well can All i right. make one small plug jackie for your no, loco no. yr party so if you are otherwise engaged and you have another party to go to, one of the things that we do really well here in Maryland is we support our YR organizations. You can buy a ticket for someone else to go. We have TARS. Um, I think we have two or three chapters of Teenage Republicans um, here in the state of Maryland. There are pretty big chapters, especially the one in Hartford. Um, we have CRs, a ton of CRs. I mean, we've got more CRs than, than um, I actually thought we did. But they had a wonderful convention, but these are young people. So they're not moneyed by any stretch of the imagination. And this is, you know, the time of year where they're struggling to buy presents for their younger brothers and sisters, that kind of thing. If you want to help, buy a ticket and tell Jackie, invite a TAR, invite a CR so that they can actually go and have a good time. Yes. We're also going to be making writing thank you letters for our uh, men and women in blue. We I read an article today that um, morale from Montgomery County Police is at an all time low. So we're going to have a table set up to write thank you letters for them because we really, really do support them and appreciate all that they do for us. And we want to keep them around, even though Governor DeSantis is making a very compelling case to move to Florida. Um, but yes, ladies, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you everybody for listening and watching and we will see you next week. One more time before Thanksgiving. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.